for, um, yeah, saying yes. Yeah. We, yeah. 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 No, that's awesome. So I'll, I'll pray for you too. Do I have to have this turned off if I go too close? I'm a novice, so <laughs> shall I keep that turned off so we don't go... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Father God, I just thank you for um, our sister, Sonia, who has said yes and willing to bring a word, and you've laid something on her heart, and Father, I, I, I just ask for your, uh, release your anointing over her, Father, uh, that your word is alive, and Father, I pray, Father, for our eyes and our ears to be open, to receive, so Father, I just pray you just bless her this morning, and that she will just, just know your flow of the Holy Spirit, Father God, and, and what she has to share in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just keep, aha, uh -huh. okay, excellent. Okay, I've come loaded with everything because I didn't quite know what I was going to need, so I'm like, okay, I've got a computer over there in case this doesn't work, but I think it's going to be all good. So, I want to start by taking you back to February 1995. So, I was 18 years old, I had just finished high school, and I was super excited, super excited, because I was about to go to Brazil for six months, where I was going to take part in an AFS cultural exchange. And so this exchange was a bit different than the ones that were happening at the time. So rather than going to school, I would be going and just serving within the community that I was um, going to be placed within. So it was about six weeks out from D-Day, from departure date, and I received a letter in the post. Now, I'd been waiting for this letter in the post because it was a letter to inform me that I had a family. And so the family that I'd been placed with was a lady called Najia, and she lived in this reasonably small, remote town. Um, it was a rural town in Brazil. Um, it was in the uh, state of Goiás, which is not a common state, which is sort of central west Brazil. And for the um, uh, service part, I would be working in a convent. So... Um, I had been away from home before on a three-month exchange to Australia, um, and so I was feeling good, you know. I knew what, you know, leaving home was, you know, all about. I could do all of that. And I'd even taken some time to um, do some Portuguese lessons with the only Brazilian that I knew, and he just happened to live at the Oxford YWAM base, and that was our very own Paulo Moreira. <laughs> and so Paulo, he did a great job, um, and I would say, when I left, I confidently knew about 40 words, um, mostly kind of around, um, you know, household everyday sort of things, common greetings, those types of things. But, you know, it gave me confidence, okay, if I can learn those words, I can learn, you know, more when I get there. And so I had, um, on the, got to the day of departure, so 9th of Feb, 1995, and heading out of Christchurch Airport, I had a, a good idea of um, the journey ahead of me, but I didn't know exactly all the details, because at that time, um, AFS Brazil, they had sorted out the flights, every, all the travel from Christchurch to Brazil, and then AFS Brazil, they do it, you know, the rest of the journey. And so um, I knew I had a long journey ahead of me, that's what I knew. And upon reaching Sao Paulo, Brazil, after 20 hours of travelling and getting on and off four flights. Um, that, you know that feeling that you sort of have of you flick between excitement and nervousness? Well, that had left me completely. A number of grumpy flight attendants ago. And now I was feeling really grumpy and really tired, hungry. Did I mention tired? And so um, I was kind of, okay, okay. I can, I can do this, I can do this. And so in Sao Paulo, we'd sort of our numbers had been reduced down to about 20. So, you know, other students had gone on their journeys, but the 20 of us that were left, um, we were bused to kind of this holding location, I guess. And um, that's where we waited. We waited our turn to be, you know, sent back out. And so everyone went out one by one or in pairs, and then there was me. 
And so I was there, headed out on my last flight, and so for this flight, I didn't have anyone with me. So on the other journeys, you know, we'd had AFS chaperones, I'd had all the other students, um, but this one I was alone. And so it was about oh, two hours, two-hour flight between Sao Paulo and Brasilia. So that's the capital city of Brazil. And the journey, it went, I thought it went really well. And I, was, I thought, oh, that was a wee bit quicker than I thought. And um, upon touchdown, you know, there was that usual post-disembarkation announcements and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And um, I couldn't understand a word. It was all in Portuguese. And none of the, you know, the 50 words that I'd learnt, they weren't in that sentence. So I was like, OK. So I thought, oh, oh, this... Well, it's probably, you know, just about waiting for the seatbelt light because, you know, that's the next announcement that happens. And then I heard the bing. I'm like, oh, oh, saw the seatbelt light go off. So I was ecstatic. I could, you know, finally get off this plane. So I jump up and I'm looking around and to my surprise, there was even people sort of still, you know, they hadn't filled the seats, you know, the aisles. You know how normally everybody just fills the aisles, they're grabbing the bags out, all of that. That didn't happen. A number of us got up, but some people, they were really patient. And I was like, oh, check them out. Not me. I was just ready to get off. And so I followed, you know, other passengers. And we went, you know, along the, the aisle, down the external plane steps, across the tarmac, and sort of through the set of double doors, straight into the baggage claim area. And so I went over and... That conveyor belt started to whir, and we were just waiting for all the bags to come. And so while I was standing there, I just sort of started looking around, taking in, you know, all these new sights and sounds and smells, looking around, and I thought, oh, oh, this isn't, you know, it's not in a secure area. This is, you know, open to the public. And then my really slow brain connection started firing, and I'm like, hmm. No one's come up to greet me yet. Um, hey, I'm here. And there didn't really seem to be anyone that sort of was looking for someone like me to arrive. So I'd received a, a photo of me, so they'd know what I look like. So, oh, OK, well, maybe they'll, they'll just be, you know, parking or maybe there's really bad traffic in the city. You know, there'll be a reason. They'll turn up. Well, after about half an hour of waiting, it was blatantly obvious my bags hadn't arrived. So I'm standing there, I'm like, OK. And to make it worse, my family, they still hadn't turned up for me. Um, oh, OK, um, yeah. And I had no phone, no way of contacting anyone. In 1995, cell phones, they were only for wealthy businessmen not sort of, you know, everyday people. So I didn't have a cell phone. Even if I did have a cell phone, I didn't have a telephone number. Um, just let me grab some water. That's better. I didn't have a telephone number. I didn't have any addresses. I didn't even have any money in, you know, Brazilian currency. So I had US dollars, but hadn't been in the country long enough to convert that. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And it was like, at that point, my optimism, it had reached its limit. And I just sat down on one of the black plastic chairs and just started to cry. And it wasn't like dramatic, the world has ended tears. Just quiet, exhausted tears. And I wasn't sitting there for long when a flight you know, check-in staff member came over and she started to try and communicate with me. And for the second time that day, I handed over the stub of my you know, flight boarding pass. And that was the best thing I could have done. So upon reading it, she just started racing around. And she raced back to her desk, then back to me, then back to the desk. And she came back and she managed to communicate with me. Miss, you should have stayed in your seat stayed in my seat? What did she mean I should have stayed in my seat? What I was about to discover was that 
I should have stayed in my seat when the plane had stopped, just like all those other really patient people. Because the flight that I was on, it was really unusual, and that it just stopped, more like a bus, in a completely different city, let people off, and then it continued on its way. But no one had told me that I needed to stay in my seat. So, by the grace of God, there was another flight heading to Brasilia. It was already loaded and ready to go. And so, without even issuing me a ticket, they raced me out the back doors, across the tarmac, up the steps, onto the plane, shut the doors, we were off. And so, I reached Brasilia, where my bags and a very relieved group of people were there waiting for me. But as I travelled on that, that last journey, it dawned on me, hold on a second, my bags, they, they would have made it to that destination. I was the one who didn't stay in my seat. And the people, the people, they will be waiting for me. I was the one who was in the wrong place. I should have stayed in my seat. And I'm really pleased to say that I went on to have an amazing time in Brazil, um, just incredible. And um, I even got to the experience of like spending five nights on the sand island in the middle of one of um, the Amazon River tribute trees. It was incredible. But I want to ask, what about you? Have you ever experienced a time when you've got to a destination and you've looked around and gone, hmm, this doesn't look what I expected. This doesn't look how I thought it might be. Is it possible that maybe you didn't stay in your seat? Maybe you left your journey a little too early and didn't remain for the, the whole journey to get to that destination, seeing what God really had planned for you. And so, I know that God has a plan for all of us. He's got an amazing plan for all of us. But we need to stay in our seats long enough to see the whole journey. And there's all sorts of journeys that we travel in life. Um, you know, and the ageing journey, that's something all of us experience. There's relationships, there's, we journey through school, you know, um, families, parenting, work journeys, our spiritual journeys. And so, so many of these journeys, they're actually happening at the same time. It's like they're happening simultaneously. And temptations of all sorts, they're going to come at us and try and take us off our journey, try and distract us, try and get us to get off in the wrong place. And I know that even Jesus, he was tempted. He was tempted to leave his journey. It didn't work, but Satan still tried to tempt him. And so this morning, I want to look deeper into some key areas that I, ident I identified in my journey um, that line up with strategies that God has for all of us in order to stay in our seats and continue the journey that God has for us. So, Nathaniel, if we can begin with, yeah. Okay, so this passage, it's a conversation between Jesus and the devil or the tempter and what happened just before this was Jesus, he'd been baptised, he'd gone, been taken out into the wilderness, he'd been out there for 40 days, 40 nights, hadn't eaten any food at this time, and then the tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. 
if you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. So I am going to come back to that. So the first area that I want to talk a little bit more about is our physical needs. So we need to be so aware of when we're under stresses, our physical needs. And it's a space that we can get tempted in though, we can get drawn off track. And I know for myself that when I'm tired, I am definitely vulnerable. And in the experience that I just shared, I've been awake for well over 36 hours, so that made me really, really vulnerable. And there's heaps of different types of stresses. We know of all the stresses that come at us in the world. And so the aim is not to avoid them, but if we know what they are, if we know what our weak points are, then we're not going to get caught up the same. And God wants us to journey through those stresses in a way that glorifies him. And as Jesse shared last week, that develops our resilience, our perseverance, our character. It grows us. And another space is to not become isolated. It's really easy for us if we're going through stresses, we've got challenges, we've got things that we are carrying of shame or guilt, then we pull back. We pull back from each other. And for me, with all those other flights, I had people with me. I had people around me. For my final flight, I was alone. In church, we need, need, need each other. We can't do this journey by ourselves. We can't. We so need each other. And God never designed our journey to be taken alone. And Jesus, let's take, so we'll flick back and we'll have a look. Because Jesus, he was tempted with physical needs. So the tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So that first temptation that, Satan tried to see if it would work on Jesus. That was about desires of the physical body. It was about bread, turning bread, stones into bread. Okay, and so Jesus, he would have been hungry. He would have been really hungry. But what Satan was trying to get Jesus to do was put his bodily needs above his physical needs. And he was trying to get Jesus to rely on himself to provide for those bodily needs rather than trust in God. Well, it didn't work. And Jesus didn't fall for that temptation because he knew that no matter what, God was going to provide for his physical needs, all of his needs. Okay, so the next area... Know God's language. And with hindsight, I'm guessing that that post-disembarkation speech on my plane ride, that it was more about reminding people to stay seated if they were going on to that next location than it was about the seatbelt light. But I didn't know the language. So I was oblivious to this message, I was oblivious to this really helpful information that was being given to me. 
And we can be a bit like that too. If we don't know God's word, if we don't know God's language, we can sort of fall for these things because it's just out of not knowing, which is why it's so important to know. So in my opinion, regularly reading the Bible, it's, it's essential. It's an essential. And some people, I, just, I admire it so much, they've got this ability to read scripture, just retain it, wrote, know where it came from, you know, they can just sort of pull, pull it out of the air and boom, I'm not that person, I am not that person. But what I've determined in my heart is that even though I'm not that person, I still really want to, I need to absorb scripture because what I can do, what God can do, is he can pull that out of me whenever he wants. Whenever God wants and desires, that's within me. And so if reading, you know, reading, reading is not your thing, there's heaps of great audio Bibles out there, um, scripture, and um, is just embedded in song. So many songs, they're just full of scripture. So does, God doesn't mind how you put it in. He doesn't mind how you get your, his word into you. It's just important to get it in. Get it in as much as you possibly can, and then he will draw it out at his time. And another um, really vital place is knowing the Holy Spirit. Know the language of the Holy Spirit. Learn to speak and hear from the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit that turns words and words of the Bible, Holy Spirit, he breathes life into them. And so to know the word, but have the Holy Spirit to breathe that life, to breathe life into you. And creating relationship, that takes time. It takes time. So don't be in a rush. Enjoy it. Enjoy learning, communicating with the Holy Spirit. So we're going to flip back to that. Excellent. Thanks, Nathaniel. And so I'll read that. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will, not, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So this second temptation, that was all around Jesus knowing God's word. And here, the devil, he tries to use scripture in Psalms to tempt Jesus. And then Jesus countered with more scripture from Deuteronomy, stating that it was wrong for him to abuse his own powers. Because sometimes Satan will come at us with something that sounds quite a lot like scripture. Kind of sounds like, oh, that might be something God would say. That's why it's so important we arm ourselves. We know what <coughs> is really in the Bible what God's really saying and allow the Holy Spirit to just illuminate that. Okay, so the, th the third area is know your destination. And that's the purpose of the journey. And for me, this is, has become, over time, a really strong incentive for me to stay in my seat. And until about two years ago, this was this area that I got really frustrated in. And I kept wondering, what's wrong with me? Why do I not get this? Why do I not know my purpose? Like some people know their purpose. And I'd soak up all this advice and I'd love to hear people speaking about purpose. But I'd run it through my filters and then what would come out would be more negative self-talk than it would be that encouragement that went in. And what I realized was, was that I was trying to find like a specific task, 
a purpose that would fit into a really neat little box and I could probably put some timelines on it and some goals and um, steps towards it. But what I realised was that I got to a point where I just needed to surrender all of that. I needed to surrender even knowing my purpose to God. I needed to trust that, does God know my purpose? Because if he knows my purpose and he tells me he has a plan, then is that good enough for me? Or do I have to know it as well so I can, you know, give him a hand along the way? Um, But when I was able to do that, just lay it all down, that's when I just found such a peace. And I knew that the relationship between God and myself, that that was my purpose, developing that, developing my character, that that was my purpose, that just gave me such a freedom. And I found my real purpose. And for that third temptation, it was important. Jesus, he knew his purpose too. So again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Oh, I haven't gotten the last bit, have I? Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Okay, so that third temptation, that was designed to try and trick Jesus into skipping out a few parts of his journey. Maybe skip to the end where he gets all the kingdoms. But what that would mean is missing out Jesus' most important part, the part that makes the biggest difference for our lives. And that meant that he was being provided like this false journey to his kingship. But Jesus, he knew what his purpose was. He knew the journey that God had for him. He trusted God that as brutal as that journey was about to be, that it was God's plan, therefore it was the best plan, the best plan for his life. And so he stepped into it and he took that and he did that willingly. And so we can learn too from Jesus' response to temptation exactly how we need to respond. And so we so need scripture to back us up, but we need hearts full of confidence in the knowledge that God has a plan for our lives as well. So, you find yourself in a spot that you didn't expect to find yourself in. You've been tempted off your journey. What do you do? Next slide, please. That's all right. Because we have to stay teachable. We have to stay teachable. And during my experience in Brazil, when I was standing alone no bag, people hadn't come to get me yet, it never once crossed my mind that I was the person in the wrong. Never. Nuka. Not one time did I stop and go, oh, I could be a part of this. And it's so easy to blame other people for our circumstances. And we have to stop doing it. And we have to be able to look at ourselves and be really, really honest to God with what's going on in our own hearts. And it really is then and only then that God can then start to bring his healing, his direction, his plan back into the journey that we have determined was the right one. 
and people the problem? It's never, ever God. It's never God. In the Bible, it clearly shows us the steps that we need to take to get back on that journey. But we have to do it. And often that means giving up in our strength and receiving God's strength, his way. God never, ever forces us to do anything either. It's always an invitation. We can say yes or no. He still loves us. It's not a matter of whether he will never, ever, ever stop loving us. But do we want to keep going on that journey, that plan? Do we want to see that unfold? That's where we get the choice. And so for the, this is the best bit. I think it's the best bit. Restoration. God, he is a God of restoration and he loves to restore us. He loves to restore what's lost. And when I was looking um, through the Bible to find some people that, you know, had been on journeys of restoration, it's full of them. It's absolutely chock full of stories of restoration. And I'm not going to go into detail um, for Job, Ruth and Joseph, but just for people who maybe don't know the stories of their lives, I'll just really briefly. So Job, he was a really um, righteous man. God called him a really righteous man. And he loved God with all his heart, but he had everything stripped from him, absolutely everything. He lost his family, just all his possessions, his wealth. He was just left with absolutely nothing. But he never once gave up on God. Then Ruth, so she was a, a Moabite woman, a young lady who married into um, an Israeli family, and then her world collapsed. All the males in the family, so her father-in-law, her husband, her brother-in-law, all of them died. She was um, in her land at the time, and her mother-in-law decided to go back to their home country. And her mother-in-law, she even encouraged her and said, stay here. Stay here, there's nothing for you if you come with me. But this young woman, she had such a faith in God that she, she you know, made that statement, you know, where you go, I go, to her mother-in-law. But that wasn't about the faith she had in her mother-in-law, that was about the faith she had in God, that if she would continue the journey that she had committed to when she married her husband, when she determined in her heart that God was her God, she then went on that journey. And Joseph, so Joseph, a young man, had God's promises spoken over him um, from a really young age. His brothers got super jealous. They were going to kill him, threw him in a pit. Some traders came by, hey, we'll just sell him instead. So he got sold into state slavery, um, spent many, many years in slavery. And Looking from the outside, you could think, oh, well, that's a guy that could just, you know, give up on God, give up on his plans, give up on the hopes. But no, he chose that through all of that and determined in his heart that he will continue to follow God. So Job, Ruth, and Joseph, they all showed remarkable faith. And faith that despite difficult circumstances, there was still a purpose ahead for them. They all had the faith to believe that God was exactly who he said he was and that God would provide for him. And their lives showed that against the odds, redemption is possible. Redemption's always possible. God restored absolutely everything that had been taken from all three of them and he gave them back even more than what they had in the first place. And redemption, it's possible in your lives. It's possible in our lives. God can do it. So no matter where you've come from, what you've been through, God has a plan that surpasses all of that. How do I know? Because God said it. And God doesn't lie. 
So he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So in conclusion, I'll ask the same question that I did earlier. Is it possible that you have left a part of your journey? Is it time to get back in your seat? And are you willing to work with God for your restoration? So if anyone um, wants prayer into that, I would love to pray with you. I'm sure the person next to you would love to pray with you. Or if there's anything else that you're wanting prayer for today. Um, there's a church full of people that are for you. We're for you. And we want to see God move. So am I allowed to ask the, <laughs> the worship team? Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs>